you were gonna get me from behind a lot, and you got that Cuban passport going. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, you're setting the camera up over there. I'm setting up here, so I thought you would be over there. Oh no, I was, I'm gonna face people. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna face people. Yeah, that's why I was gonna do it. Here. Got it. Now I understand. Yeah. I was like, nobody wants to see this much of that. You had so many different, so many different options. Yes, yeah, totally. So many yeah. different options. <laughs> Let me know when you guys are ready. Guys, a little housekeeping. A little housekeeping. Hi, I'm Karaming. A little housekeeping. The mic um, is it's a shotgun mic, so we don't have the handheld mic. So in order for them to hear you, make sure that you're saying it in the direction of the camera. Otherwise, what they'll hear is the sound going this way and that way. So just be aware of that because I fully expect all of you guys to have really valuable <coughs> insights to bring to what we're doing today, and I want all the HowlRound watchers to see it as well. And uh, you guys let me know when you're ready, or can I start, or? Okay, I'll start. I'll start. Use the mic. All right. So, um, my name is Carmen Pelais. Hi, nice to meet you. I, uh, what do you call it? I did, uh, I've been theater making like for what feels like forever. Uh, from Miami originally, went to American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York, spent 22 years in New York. Um, most of my work, however, got produced in Miami first. Um, I'm old enough to remember a time where uh, I was not a Latino artist, I was just an artist. And I was not um, a Cuban playwright, I was just a playwright. Or a female playwright, I was just a playwright. When I was gonna move back down from New York to Miami, because I was like, I don't wanna live in a city bank, I'm going back to Miami. Um, I, people were like, oh, wait, what, what, you're gonna go back to Miami? But what, what's happening there, whatever. I had shot a short, couple short films down here, I'd done work here, and I knew that in Miami, I could kind of release that, those tags again, right? And I was like, well, in, in New York, I've become a Latino playwright, a female playwright. I've been told, well, we have our Latino playwright this season, send us another play, which I'm sure you all have heard. Or I've been told by a very prominent <coughs> Latino theater, uh, why don't you go be the Latino playwright token at a white theater because you're Cuban and people kind of can't stand Cubans because you all are bougie and <laughs> that's the way they'll like you over there. So <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my experience. So one of the things that I was most looking forward to moving back to Miami was that I was gonna get to be Carmen Pelais again. I didn't have to fit into anybody's pigeonhole. But this is, this pigeonhole is a double-edged, it's, it's an opportunity, it's a catch-22, right? Without the scholarship, without the work that like this conference is doing, without our scholars recognizing us and pulling us out of spaces that were kind of relegated to a drawer, our work doesn't get recognition, right? Because the people, the gatekeepers, the people that are deciding just don't have the same life experience and they don't look for us. So we have to stand out as Latino playwrights. We have to stand out as female playwrights. We have to stand out as queer playwrights. As any tag or any identifier that sets us apart. Politically, we need that. But does our art need it? And this is what is a little, roll with me a little bit on this because it's kind of been, um, it's a little like crazy, but like if Tennessee Williams were working today, would he be known as a gay playwright that only does gay material? There is not a Tennessee Williams play that isn't brilliantly gay, right? <laughs> They're all so wonderful and they, and they speak to such a full context. It, they, they look at life clearly through a gay lens, but he's not relegated to anything. And I think because we needed this political empowerment in the industry, we've fallen a little bit into a trap of writing only to identity as opposed to having it be a starting point. We've made it an end point. And I feel that that gets very dangerous because then we're fulfilling an expectation that people that aren't us are setting for us and not our experience. So the reason I wrote my first solo play wasn't to show how many accents I can do, like, <laughs> There's a time when like, people, like I developed one monologue at a time in these nights in New York that you'd go, you'd show up, they'd give you 10 minutes, you'd do whatever you want. 
and I would develop and I would see. And I would be super, what I guess back then would have been hipster audience, audiences and very politically aware and all with the, you know, with the banjo, and political commentary, like something they can have, right? And then I would show up with like, La Santera from La Sahuesera Iluminada. <laughs> or I'd show up as my grandmother taking a break of a hunger strike shift. And they'd be like, Cubans are so crazy, how can you do hunger strikes in shifts? <laughs> And I'm like, well, because they're starving Cuban people on purpose. We're not going to starve ourselves here just for like the show of it, right? We're protesting that. I understood that there was a disconnect between the Miami Cuban experience and the way Cubans were seen everywhere else, and our very real and lived trauma, and the way everybody else, what everybody else expected us to be, right? So I go from Miami, where it was very clear what the revolution had done, to New York, where people say, well, I think Fidel's been very good for Cuba. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Right? Or, well, I've been to Cuba and I know. So then I was like, all right, then I have to go to Cuba because I'm not going to hear that from one more gringo. I'm not going to hear it again. I'm not going to hear from one more anybody. My Latino friends in New York would tell me that I wasn't really a Latina. I was a sellout because I was a white Latina. And I didn't feel that way. I felt solidarity with all Latinos. I didn't even realize I was a Latino until I got to New York. It was like, spick, and I'm like, que? Uh -huh. What's that? Because here we're their majority and we exist in every socioeconomic spot. So it really just became about money and not about cultural identity because we're all over the place and we're in power, economic and political power. So I just, it, it was an understanding of, oh, wait a minute, there's different Latino experiences in this country and I have to stand shoulder to shoulder with them because I come from a very privileged Latino class. We got entry, we got papers, we got everything. How can I spread, how can I support their struggle? <clears throat> but they never wanted to support mine, which is cool, everybody's got their way. But I wasn't gonna let other people, American or other Latinos, denigrate my experience or say that my grandparents <laughs> left on a yacht, right? And they were just like these bougie bastards that didn't care about anybody and we we're just as middle class as everybody else. And so I would hear the things people would say about Cubans and I put them into characters, studying Whoopi Goldberg's solo show, that could say them what she said the most dangerously, right? And the most honestly. But I also used humor. And this reminds me of something that, oh God, I just looked her up. I saw this Sundance Institute thing of the director of Bend It Like Beckham, she gave this little video. And she said, you know, I like to make comedies and I like to make movies that affirm our experience not necessarily to deal with our struggle because our struggle isn't within our community, it's they're imposing our struggle on us. So let them deal with their crimes against humanity. I wanna deal with how we survive and how we thrive and how we go about dealing with the things that everybody goes about and deals with. And she's what, like the first Latin director to work in Great Britain, like it, she, she's broken all kinds of barriers with her movies. And that was kind of the approach that I had. Who do you think broke Hitler's heart? <coughs> Who do you think broke Hitler's heart? Rita Anybody? Rita Hayworth. I don't know. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think broke Hitler's heart? Mel Brooks says this. Charlie Chaplin. Because Hitler was a huge Charlie Chaplin fan. And he did The Great Dictator. And when Charlie Chaplin did The Great Dictator, Hitler said, no more Charlie Chaplin for anybody. <laughs> and he totally turned against Charlie Chaplin. And something Mel Brooks says is, there's no way to deal with the horrors of the Holocaust. There's no way to fathom the horrors of the Holocaust. So how do you turn it around and make fun of it and, and show them how you survive and show them how you still have the power to laugh, right? So that's kind of what I, my approach is in being political. I'm not gonna stand here on a soapbox. I'm a progressive, true blue, born in the, you know, born Democrat, hardcore, anybody outside of Miami thinks I'm Marco Rubio. And there's no way I can do to fight that. I was like, I think he's an asshole. I tell him all the time on Twitter. <laughs> but there's no way to fight that, right? There's no way for me to explain the conservatism of my grandparents comes because they saw their friends die on the shores in Bay of Pigs because the CIA organized something and they were betrayed by Kennedy at the last minute. <clears throat> They were very, it was a very progressive country before. But I can show a little bit of the method behind the madness. But my approach is if you go, if you go to the top layer, you're gonna alienate a lot of people. 
I always try and go vertical, right? I always try and approach my politics like, what, if, if, if what bothers you is colonialism, you have so many different levels of colonialism to play with. Explore all of them. In, in not in, they, they come and take this. Go further, what's, what's wrong about colonialism? Anybody, what's wrong about colonialism? Genocide. Genocide. Destroying local economies. Destroying local economies. Appropriation. Appropriation. All of that could be a comedy. Destroying local economy, you could write a, a, a play about colonialism in a mom and pop shop that incorporates gentrification as well, which appropriates appropriation where somebody gets murdered. I mean, you almost have to do the right thing there, right? That's basically <laughs> slavery in America, right? Or like racism in America. So it's, to me, it's been, it's, it's been very fruitful. When I get mad about something, the first thing I do is head to my computer and just write it out, and I usually make a joke out of it. Um, that's my approach, but I find that when we go deeper, we're going to find that, that common well that we can all identify to. That somebody that's American that doesn't care about colonialism, that's tired of hearing it, they can't walk away from it because they care about their neighborhood changing or something. You know what I'm saying? So I try and find those commonalities. I, I keep trying to dig until I find the universal and then I take that universal, that what I've mined that's universal, and I put it into a Cuban character, if I feel like doing a Cuban character, right? So that's been my approach. And I also think there's something really powerful about kind of standing up and taking the hate, right? Like when I, when I said, when they told me to speak Spanish, I died laughing. Because my first, you know, when I was told to speak Spanish, you're an American, I'm like, being in America guarantees my right to speak however many languages I know. Yeah. My dog is bilingual, yeah. and you're not. That's not my fault. <laughs> you know, and they're just like, oh, Carmen, no, don't be like that. But you know, you have to be like that a little bit because you can get a lot farther with a laugh, mm -hmm. and you can break a heart with a laugh. I always say that I like to explore that space that laughter and devastation live in the same moment. I've known true horror. I've had people in my family murdered. I'm horrified right now knowing that the ice raids are gonna happen. Because I know what it's like to have family members in Cuba and friends in Cuba all of a sudden be disappeared by the government, right? So how do you live in that, not let it drive you crazy, and put it in a light where, you, like Whoopi Goldberg said, you can put him in a petting <coughs> zoo. Make, put something really dangerous right in front of somebody and make them not wanna walk away from it, or not wanna be like, oh, I can't take another story about this again, which we all hear. I think, I, you know, I wrote this, I was, had this contract and I was in, on the Paramount lot, on the Desilu lot, the Desilu Cabanas, okay? And I'm here thinking, God, this is a Cuban, this is a Cuban American, like, this is like my spot, like, that, this is my cultural spot, right? And I had written this pilot and I was all excited because it was bilingual and it was showing these two sisters in Brooklyn and how they were kind of making it on their own and, and this and that and I was, thrilled and this Paramount executive wanted to meet me and I was all like, oh, and she, and this, this person was heading like a, a show that I will not mention, but it was doing really well at the time. Sat down, she said, I love the dialogue, great. I love the story, great. I love the characters, they're so much fun, great. Like, but they're both Latino, I'm like, yes. And then not one of them's pregnant or has a drug problem. Okay. And I'm like, <gasps> no. <laughs> yeah, but nobody's gonna be able to relate to that. <laughs> oh my God. And I was like, I, I, I can relate. I related to the Cosby show. And I'm not black, and I wanted a drug problem, or was pregnant. And they're like, yeah, but we love the dialogue, we love the characters, but, right? There's always gonna be that but. So you ultimately, I think, to be hyper-political, you have to be hyper-excellent, but put yourself in a space that they cannot deny. So my characters, for example, in Rum and Coke, one of them deals with death, the other one deals with humiliation, the other one deals with separation, the other one deals with fear of action, which we can all relate to. And it's a highly political show, but I've been told time and time again, oh, it's, it's interesting, because I thought I was gonna get like a soapbox Cuban thing, and it wasn't like that at all. 
I'm not interested in that. But I also have people come up and tell me, you know, I've been to Cuba many times, I never thought about what the people there were going through. Great, it's just a couple stories, take it for what you will. And I think that's what we can all aspire to as artists. We want to communicate the human condition. We want to communicate the way that we see the world. Everything is political. Everything is a political act. And I find my approach personally is to take that act, it, it is to approach the work as joyfully as possible, but without pulling a punch. Don't pull any punches. I punch to the Cuban side all the time. I just did my new play, Fake. I criticize Cubans so fast and hard. And the funny thing is a lot of the people that I were criticizing came over and told me, great, great work. And I'm like, great, you saw yourself in it, right? <laughs> but we have to hold our own accountable as well because otherwise we're just victims. We have no agency. So my approach is don't pull a punch. Hold your own, your own people accountable because if you don't, you have no agency. And do it joyfully. Do it in a way that people can relate to. That doesn't mean pleasing people. That means finding the most universal way that your characters, that your story thrives. If you see people get knocked down a lot, that's all you think they're ever capable of. But if you start your story at the moment that, that, the moment that they get up, then you got them. And I think you have to be dangerous with it. I don't think you can be careful with it. Because when you're careful, you're boring. Everybody knows as a person of color, you've gotta be excellent. You've gotta be better than everybody else. We'll really know that we've all made it if we can write a really boring play about Latino ennui, <laughs> like all the gringos do, <laughs> and get Broadway productions. Well, hey, we finally made it. <laughs> but that's never interested me anyways. So I would encourage you when you're really furious about something, try and find the moment of light in it, the moment of laughter in it, and start from there, even if it's not a comedy. I mean, how many of you have ever laughed at a funeral? Oh. <laughs> I'm, I guess there's a lot of Cubans in the room. <laughs> you have funerals, like, ah, we're all a bunch of parrots, right? And we're all like, because that's, it, it's in those moments, that, those moments are the most life affirming, you know? And it's when, when, you, when you don't have that laughter, you don't have that way to turn it on, you, you, you lose your ability to point out the weakness of the oppressor. And I think that that's what gives you the ultimate power when you're dealing with something politically. When you're very heavy handed, people walk away. They don't enter, they, they wanna give you the pat on the head, but they keep you separate from them. Get in their heads, get in their homes, get in their emotions. And we all have the ability to do that because we're all human beings, right? I mean, some of us. <laughs> but if you use identity as an ending point, you're never gonna get much further than that. That's our beginning. That's what puts us ahead of the game. And then the organizations and the scholars and the, organi and, 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 and the people, that, the, the, the advocates, are the ones that push our work forward. But we have to make our work emotionally compelling, truthful, viciously funny, or viciously tragic, but just, we gotta go deep. Because otherwise, we stay in this very mid-level range that people don't really respond to, and then they can just keep us there. And it's just kind of nothing. And they pat themselves on the head, look, we have a Latina here today. She's the Latina from our season, stand up her. Carmen, yes, my name is Carmen. And don't be afraid to be challenging that, right? <clears throat> With my play Fake, I had the run in Miami. It was awesome. Everything went great. Several theaters nationally wanted to see it. And then I had a couple conversations. Like, oh, this will be good for our Latino mm -hmm. spot. I was like, God, I forgot I'd written a Latino play. <laughs> I thought I was writing a play about the intersection of art and economy and politics. I forgot I'd written a Latino play and it was a shock. Don't be anybody's token. Refuse to be anybody's token. Have your identity as your point of pride. It's the best of what we've got and just fucking go for it. Whatever you say, say it for real. Say it with an exclamation point.
say it deeply. We have such a profound experience. When you look at Latin America and the Caribbean, you look at our natural resources, and if it weren't for our shittiest governments that go back and forth between left and right, we would be a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And US imperialism, all of it, there's no question. There's a reason they keep us here. But I also think of Yoani Sanchez, who is a dissident in Cuba, and she says, I'm a free Cuban. I don't let them tell me what I'm feeling. They can manipulate how much food I have, but I'm not gonna let them get in my head. So I live in Cuba and I live freely. And we have to choose, in my opinion, as artists, what my approach is, is to live freely to tell my story, to go deep, to kind of like go through that first couple of layer, get rid of that, and go, okay, what really bothers me about colonialism? The injustice. My sister went to Miramar the other day to help the Circle of um, Protection, this group of people that go and help immigrants that are lining up to check themselves into ICE. And she said it broke her fucking heart because all these families were dressed in their Sunday best to present themselves to these savages. And they didn't want to let them give them juice or water. You know, why are we presenting them ourselves to these people apologetically? Or with, okay, you're gonna let me walk in here? We bust through that door and be fearless about it. Because our stories are incredible and they haven't been heard. And they don't fit in a lane. They're all over the place. We really, once we all start telling our stories as humanly as possible and just without the target of what the theater wants, but what we need to say, those walls, I think, are just gonna disintegrate. Because the power of the Latino theater artists that I've met, Latinx, whatever, I'm terrible with names, that I've met. Now what I would like to know, that's way too much more than me that I was planning on saying. What I really wanna know is how you guys deal with it. I wanna know how, what your approach is what you depend on as Latino artists, what gets in your grill, and how you exercise those demons, how you deal with the subject matter, what's in your toolkit to deal with politics? How do you approach it? And, it, and that can mean your theatrical life or in your activist <coughs> life. Because I think as Latinos, you can't help but be an activist. You have to be, especially in these times. Yeah. I think this is a really interesting time now where we're wondering, are we gonna be infiltrators? Or are we just gonna have our own thing? And um, I looked it up, so I didn't know this, but I looked up Mel Brooks's real name, Melvin Kaminsky, mm -hmm. and that's, and obviously, you know, it was at, at a completely different time in, in showbiz names and whatever that is. Right. But, um, but to me, that's the idea of like, we've gotta infiltrate. We've gotta get our stories in there through the cracks, yeah. and then maybe they'll like us a little better because we're already in their house, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the mentality that I think we're on the, uh, uh, Miami's an interesting scene now, it's burgeoning, you know? And, um, and uh, we have a little theater in, in, in Haiti, a little Haiti, little um, Haiti. Little Haiti excuse me, <laughs> a little theater in Little Haiti, um, that is, um, <coughs> that we try to operate as if, hey, we don't need that validation. We, um, I, when I think of like a show like Atlanta on TV, or I think mm -hmm. of, um, you know, um, other groups that, like Los Spookies, which is like a new show yeah, on TV, right. um, which is kind of them just being like, this is us, we don't care what you think. It's That's us. huge. And isn't right. that another, uh, that is a political act, I think, but it also means that we need to invest in our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We need to care about all of our community members and support them, and because if we're relying on their infrastructure, right. then no we're way. playing by their rules and we're infiltrated. That's a great point. Do you know, I, I have something right now that we're pitching to, for distribution to a couple places, and the producer said to me, well, Netflix says Latinos don't watch content made for Latinos, according to their metrics. So Netflix is out. And <coughs> it's true. It's true, actually. They do, Latinos, the, the content made for Latinos isn't being watched by Latinos. Well, what kind? Yeah, what is it? Is it, is it, is it no, no. American Lati Latinx content mm -hmm. yeah. isn't being watched by American Latinos. And this is where the other, this is the rub, right? Okay. Um, something, who, how many of you have seen Cru de Cuervos on Netflix? Do you mean no? Baby Jesus, please watch, go ahead and watch this. It is what, one of the most, Cru de Cuervos, it's one of the most <laughs> amazing series. It's a Mexican production. 
It is about a footballing family. It is brilliant. It plays, it does play in the upper socioeconomic uh, world in Mexico, but it also shows the corruption. It shows the systematic abuses. It's hilarious. And they, well, it, it was a marketing thing. They tried to market Cruz de Cuervos for Latinos and they, no, they tried to market Narcos for Latinos and Latinos did not watch Narcos, but they went to Cruz de Cuervos and the Americans watch Narcos. Yes. The Americans watch Narcos. And I told my producer, I've never had a Latino audience, which is true. When I was in Off-Broadway, I did not have a Latino audience. <coughs> Most Cuban show I could possibly written. I had a Cuban audience, because Cubans tend to support Cuban. Cuban, Cuban, theater. Cuban theater. I did not have a lot of Dominican or Puerto Rican people coming to the show or Mexican people coming to the show in New York. In Miami, there's everything, because we're all here and we're all over the place. But I didn't have that audience either. So this expectation of this like Latino audience, what is that Latino audience? Which is what you're saying. You, if we have to build our <coughs> infrastructure, because we get Celia Cruz and Madonna, yeah. or like Lady Gaga and still Celia Cruz, because Miami Radio never changes. Yeah. But <laughs> we, we have those benefits, right? But, but I think it's because of our community. We're infused by also the American uh, way. And being first generation, we straddle both sides. Right. You really don't represent any side, because you're not. So we, we straddle, and so within the, com the I, I find that within the Latin community of performers here, everyone stays in their own little house. And we don't really, and even in, in, in the American more uh, 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 theaters, it's the same thing. No. Nobody does this. There's very little There's weaving. Not, I found nothing. that to be true in New York too. And the same thing I find with with material right. is is um, in 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 doing. Um, I, I, I wrote a piece, and in in it, when they wanted to take it up north, they asked me to change some of the characters to not be so Cuban right, right. and throw in a Dominican in there. And could you not do the Puerto Rican? Let's clean her up. Let's not have her be, uh, the, and I'm like, wait, right. wait, in order to, then we can have people, I, I, was, I was just like, what is happening? Because the problem is we've, we've accepted the default being Anglo-American. Yeah. Right? We've, decept, we've accepted the default being Anglo-American. We all crossed the room when we said, somebody said, oh, well, you don't really look Latin. Mm -hmm. I've gotten that all my life, and seriously, palma en la frente. Like, I bleed Cuban sugar. I do not get more Cuban, and yet I got, you don't look Latin all the time because I'm Italian. a white Cuban. I got Italian, Jewish, those are the things that I would, you know, or I would get sent out to read lines with the N-word in it, and I'm like, I can't read that, it's got the N-word. And they're like, why not? And I'm like, because it's got the N-word, I can't say that, it's not right. Yes. So, th but they want to, they want to, why do they water it down? <coughs> they don't want to see us individually. Can you imagine if you tell an Italian, an Irishman, an Englishman, well, you're all European, can't you, the Sopranos, can't you just because that's what they told Coppola, and he said, no, I'm casting all Italians in this, with the exception of the one character. Because it goes to, he had the power to say, no, we only get the power if we have the infrastructure. So I think your idea, Peter, of kind of like sourcing, res like putting together resources and being in spaces, the fact that you have Bill in theater, which you could have here on 8th Street, which would be more central technically to the core of the city, but you have it in North Miami and people still go, and it's in little Haiti, and people so you know, and, and you have that interaction. I think is very powerful, and it's one of the things that makes Miami most interesting. Yeah, well, the difference is, it's like it's a space. It's it's us saying that we have real estate, and and um, and that's something I think in when we're talking about just Miami in general. It's a, it, that's one of our limited resources we don't talk about enough. It's like, of course, our actors leave. Where where are they going to go? Right. You know, and um, and we can have as many schools as we want. We if we don't have enough stages. Not just physical, but digital and video and all of that stuff too. Absolutely. You know, um, and uh, and so honestly, when we started the place, it was kind of like a you know what is that Field of Dreams movie? Is that build it, they will come sort of thing? And 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 then uh, the way that we've grown is to be like, well, how much more can we take? Right. You know, open border policy of um, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> that that we're not looking for actors. We stopped looking for actors. These are regular people coming. And right. I feel like if we ha if we set our bar too high, you know, um, 
then we won't allow someone to become an actor. We won't allow someone to think of themselves as an artist. And, and then our Latinos who maybe are, have the immigrant mentality in their head or are properly trying to put food on the table, right. you know, um, they, don't, they, they don't have the time, like, you know, hierarchy of needs. They're not thinking art. Right. You know? Art is a perfect. But yeah. art, uh, we know art is essential for your soul. And, and to the, and, and, um, and, but if we don't have the kind of basic, everybody can come in, you can do this too mentality, this stage can be yours um, mentality, then we're, we're turning off Latinos. Who gets hurt the most? Right. Uh, you know? Right. I think, I think building a space, creating an infrastructure where people can work together and that's open. I think that's key because, like you said, their infrastructure, their rules, our infrastructure, our rules. Yeah. I think that's a great. That's a great. I, did, can anybody here in their own cities? Do they know of a place where they can build their infrastructure? Do you have no. a place you can build your infrastructure? I know you have a. I'm coming to you next. Do you have a place where you can build an infrastructure? Well, um, I've worked at the Milagro Theater in Portland, Oregon, which is dedicated to Latinx theater making. It's been around for 35 years, so it's Latinx identified theater in Portland, Oregon, which is a very, you know, la Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, is a very small minority. So right. as far as creating infrastructure, it is an infrastructure mm -hmm. that right. has also yielded an opportunity as a center, and in essence is, is a way in which, as a center, as an arts and culture center, has been able to support the creation of other, um, uh, uh, other <coughs> projects, uh, Latinx, um, what is it called, the uh, Intercambio de Artistas Latinos. So uh, different projects that have that have engendered um, it multidisciplinarily in the Portland area to support theater making. So that's one way to approach it is to find hosts, frankly, people that have been around for a while. Right. So that's just one strategy. That's a great idea. Maybe like go to, to <coughs> people that have been around for a while and say, hey, I've got this idea. How can we open this up a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Oh, I think also thinking too of like infrastructure in terms of like, like the resources and just like help each other get opportunities, but also like what are spaces for healing? What are actual spaces for us to be together? Yeah. Such as this one, right? Because this is, I, I had done like a lot of um, POC only like affinity space organizing back in Philly. And I can't tell you how many times that somebody came up to me after, the, after our sessions and been like, oh, thank God I'm not around white people. <laughs> and like just happy to be around each other. And there was such joy in the room to have just those spaces. And then, you know, I noticed how often the, the tone of the conversation changed when we talked about white people. Like whenever we talked about white people, it was suddenly about them, you know, and it became, it was so different when we were just in a space with just ourselves, you know, talking about what we cared about, right? So I think so, thinking of resource also as like a space for, for mm -hmm. healing and not, I think like sometimes I try to think less about like in terms of competition, like when am I gonna get my piece? You know? That, that you brought up a couple of really good points. When am I going to get my piece? Mm -hmm. We have to understand that there's enough for all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm the first one. I, I just applied for a scene fest thing, and like I was talking to five other people that applied for the scene fest thing too. Mm -hmm. White men never think, oh, I'm going to get it from that white guy. They just think, oh, I'm going to get this award. Right. right? Like We also have to understand that we have space for all of us. Something also actually that is a question to you, because I'm experiencing this now, like, after living in New York, New York is the most like undercover racist place in the world, which kind of makes me freaking crazy because I get just the prejudices and the things that they say to you. Bessie Smith said, um, "In the South, they don't they don't mind if you get big, but they just don't want you to get too close. In the North, they don't mind if you get close, but they just don't want you to get too big, mm -hmm. right? But this is the thing." When we, st and I'm prejudiced right now totally toward the Americano, right? Because I'm in Miami now, and whenever I see them, I'm like, oh, it's a cosa americana. Like, it drives me crazy. Because I lived in New York for 22 years, and I was on the other <coughs> side of it. But if we're closed off also, I think, to white people, we're doing the same thing that they did to us, yeah. in a way. And, and I'm asking this. I'm not giving you a prescriptive. I'm asking this. How can we, I'll give you an example. I was asked to do this thing by this theater that g goes into this women's shelter, and it's gonna be all women going in. And I'm like, oh, that's great, but a lot of the kids at this shelter are boys also, and they only have examples of violent men of color in their life. We have a couple of men of color in our group that are amazing. Wouldn't it be great to teach them how to be vulnerable again with these men as examples? Well, no, it's not about that. And I'm like, it's not about that for you because you're a rich white lady. 
and you can live a separatist life. These kids can. So how is there a, are we ready? I understand the, 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 the us only space, the tribal spaces, the communal spaces, the safe spaces, because to me that's Miami, <laughs> like it's ridiculous. But are we, are we in danger? And this is a question to everybody. Are we in danger of letting that prejudice get in our way and not seeing other people's humanity? Yes. Like, the, like, I don't think I have an easy, even as somebody who has done that organizing, I don't think I have an easy answer to that question. I consciously made the choice to exist outside of institutions and to try to do that. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I like have the answers, but I think mm -hmm. oftentimes I've said like, well, why don't you just self-produce? And then people respond, well, I don't have the, I don't wanna self-produce. I don't have the means to self-produce. Yeah. Right. I don't have the skills to self-produce. I don't even have the, you know, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. And that's something that's even in itself like a privilege to be able to even think about, right? Right, right. It's like how, like for me to actually like do the crowdfunding campaign, raise $3,000, you know, yeah. do all that stuff, like yeah. to have that donor base built, right? Mm -hmm. is something that like I don't necessarily, I know there are people out there who don't know how to do that. Like I think, however, what I've encountered is like it's the repeated frustration over and over again, like this collective, like frustration that like, you know, professionals who are like twice my age telling me, you know, about mm -hmm. repetition of cycles, right? Right, yeah. And so for me, exactly. I wanna cut into that and I wanna be like, no, actually like, I wanna try something different or find, yeah. you know, organizers who try to think in a different way yeah. about that kind of stuff. I think that's great too. And both, both are valid in my opinion. Right. Like I think that all approaches are valid. Yeah. Like I think like that approach is like, I should have a right to exist in my weird radical commie space. And then Absolutely. other people should have a right to find, like to sort of thrive within institutions. Mm -hmm. I, that's my belief at least. That's I mean, it's really religion, fit. right? It's, it's just the, the way in which you communicate your art. Like producing these things <coughs> are the way in which we communicate our art, but they're all, they all have valid, it, they all have valid late, like they all have valid sp spaces <coughs> and places and approaches. It's art, that's what's wonderful about it. You can throw up a white canvas when Milevich threw up his white canvas, everybody was like, what, is that just a white canvas? And he's like, no, no, no. And everybody's mesmerized by the white canvas because it's got red, blue, yellow, green, black, purple, and then white. And when you're standing in front of it, you know there's more layers there. So it's just like, I think that if you have that, that passion and you have that clarity of what you wanna create, I think finding spaces outside of institutions is awesome if you can't create your own institution because that's its own skill set. Like a good producer, is its own skill set. And a good marketer is its own skill set. So that's really valid too. So how do you break out of the, the mold of, of producing to find your own way? And sometimes it's as easy as, you know, asking somebody, hey, this is closed at night. Can I get in here? Do you mind? Um, if I can just add something to that. Um, and I'm from Miami as well. And um, I also, uh, you know, help run a theater here in, in Miami. Which one? Just the funny improv theater. Oh, oh so I live right by there, five minutes yeah. away. So, um, and we, you know, we have a, a Latinx a improv festival that we're launching actually mm -hmm. next month for the first time, which is really cool. Um, and um, so there's an opportunity for people who identify with that or have any kind of, any, any written materials or anything to, to, you know, to have that represented. Um, but also I think it's great that, yeah, if you have something, you know, we wanna be able to help, uh, you know, hone those th that, that development in any way possible to to reach out to somebody who's saying like oh yeah you know what are you doing on Sunday afternoon there's nothing okay well let's make it happen you know yeah let's just come and work it out let's work it out filmmakers yeah. in Miami do that a lot Absolutely. actually Daniel and I we have a mutual friend and we we, we kind of support each other's projects a lot I'm gonna be collaborating with Peter Meir um, going up to the 2020 cycle on political videos that we're gonna put out to support the candidates that we that we support but it's just we, we kind of pool resources, the filmmakers in Miami pool resources a lot, just because somebody's got a camera and somebody's got lights. <laughs> and somebody's got the space and somebody's got the van. So the theater needs so much less technically that, that it'd be kind of, I wish theaters did it more. But theaters need to be able to be like, yo, I have this space. If you're looking for something, you better come over here. Like this guy, I didn't know him, but he sent us something about, oh, I have a, a script, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, theaters is any good? All right. Is he Hispanic? Awesome. Let's freaking do it. Right. So I think that little prejudice like can go a long way, you know? <laughs> right. I was like, oh, his last name's Mendoza. The other guy's name was Otaso. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> we got some Cubans in here. Right. Let's do it. And you know, it's not prejudice.
to this, but there's something fantastic about the Jewish community. You talked about Mel Brooks. Yeah. They are always pushing themselves up. They're worried about their community at all times. They're mm -hmm. celebrating their community at all times. And we need to be doing the same thing. And if you have a little slice of privilege, you should be telling your entire community and seeing who else can benefit from that privilege. That reminds me of a story. There's two old Jews at a cafe. And I think I heard this from Mel Brooks, too. Clearly, that documentary really impressed me. Um, there's two old Jews at a cafe. One of them is reading um, uh, an article that has like these horrible caricatures of Jews. Like horns on their head, they're dirty, they're bankrupt, like money cut, like horrible caricatures of Jews. And the other one's reading the paper of all the anti Semitic hate crimes that were reported that week. And then the guy that's reading the paper about the crimes, like, how can you read? How can you buy that? That they're making fun of us. How can you, you know, this is what's happening to Jews in the world. And you're just sitting here, like, paying money to see these caricatures and you're laughing. And he goes, well, your paper tells us how we're victims, my tells us how we're successful. They only want to take you down if you're successful. If you're not successful, they're not going to bother making fun of you. They only want to take you down if you're successful. You know, and I think the Jews have done that extremely well. You know, they, they, they will laugh in your face and they'll take your caricature and turn it around and make you laugh so hard that you feel like an asshole. Look at the producers and look at how much money that made and look at how many people saw that because they took that to the nth so it was just like stratospheric. So I think, it, I, I do agree that like sometimes we, we do have to help each other out. I just meant with the thing of like, are we becoming like them a little bit and like pushing out? Because if the, the whole thing is inclusive, you said you're a communist. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Listen, I'm completely anti-communist, but you know what? I will fight for your right to say whatever you have to say and I will support your art as long as I like it even if it's <laughs> communist, right? Some of my favorite artists are communists, you know? But it's just, to me, it's like about a level playing field for everybody. And until we get there, we have to kind of like cheat the balances a little bit, or not cheat, but create better balances. But we all have to like really come together and, and help prop each other up in a substantive way and also in a critical one, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And also in a critical one, because it's not just like, oh, she's Latina, so I'm gonna support whatever she does. If it doesn't speak to you, we have to have a standard, because that's the other thing. If we don't have a standard, we're the dollar store. For sure. mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be the dollar store. <laughs> yeah. Even though there's great things at the dollar store. I got a ceramic shark that's like, <laughs> you keep raising your hand. Oh, so much, so many things. Um, no, not right now. <laughs> no. No, no, it, 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 it's, it's because it's <clears throat> you have talked so many amazing things. Oh, and good. thank you for being here and opening the conversation in this way. I totally agree with the fact that uh, theater is art and art is art and we should not divide art <coughs> by, I don't know if you have said that, but I mean, I believe this. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we should divide, divide art by color or ethnicity or different labels. I think we should help each other, definitely as we, uh, being successful and that, but we have to find a way. No matter what, we are all immigrants, somehow. Mm -hmm. And we are in this land. And this land, when I first moved here, I was like, well, what's my formula? Well, I have to go to school. I have to do this, I have to do that in order to get this. What's my action? What are the conflicts? How am I gonna resolve it? All of that fun stuff, Stanislavski. So, uh, uh, I am, I think I have privilege of being here in Miami. We are not a minority. Yeah, we're a minority majority city. Here, so <laughs> here, and I have had a nice way, I have a nice job, I full time, whatever, all the benefits. Uh, and there is a way, and the system that works here in America, I think it's, it's work, and we can all make it work to have more Hispanic representation, more Latin representation, more of our work there. But I think we should also work hard on not creating a wall <coughs> that will divide us from, from the people who are still the majority. Mm -hmm. And otherwise it's gonna be like what happened in 2016 and uh, the Latin community is very different from like the black community and other communities. Miami voted Republican. No, Miami voted Republican. No, sorry, no, so Florida. Uh, so Actually, because I worked on the Hillary campaign, I'm very proud to I, say. Uh, oh. Miami outperformed, um, Hillary outperformed Obama by 88,000 votes in Miami-Dade County. Tampa, Orlando, 88,000. 
she did better than Obama, and Obama did great in 2012. Miami's actually a solidly blue, Dade County is solidly blue. Yeah. So I had <laughs> wrong numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, overall, there are many Republicans yeah. Yeah. here in Miami. Sure. So the vo they're vocal Republicans. Uh, they are very they're vocal. They're vocal, yeah, yeah. Very. Lots of resources. Which lo yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And it's Wait, like, this we, which. Resources. Yeah. Put a pin in that. And, I, come back and I think the thing is about getting those things. Finding the formula. How do you apply for grants? How do you get your work produced? Look at what the right steps are. Not, I don't know. Well, it's I love this because right he's wrong. like, I don't need the system. Fuck you, system. <laughs> and you're like, that system, let me tell you something, I've been very organized. <laughs> And that system works if you put it to work, and that's what's great about it. Well, it's like dipping your toes in it, too. Like, I think there's a way to exist in both. Right. That I, like, try to. Like, I don't necessarily, like, I'm part of, for example, like, a non nonprofits, you know, in, in you know, the, the for different companies in Philly. But there's also a part of me that's like, oh, man, but, like, the nonprofit industrial complex forces people, yes, like, <laughs> to, like, yeah. to, like yeah. not 501c3s to behave yeah. like corporations, right. which then yeah. affects hiring practices, which then affects the board and, like, what kind of big well, decisions but they but make. No, 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 matter right. what, no, no matter what, we're in America, an industrial capitalistic country mm. where money is speech, mm -hmm. and if you have more money and more resources, you can speak more and louder mm -hmm. and make more movement. So we have to make more money. But uh, uh, what I wanted nice. to That's funny that you said that too, because I purposely write, um, like when I wrote Fake, it's about the art world and my character, because um, please, I'm a fat Cuban. If I don't write for myself, I'll never see a stage. Hell yeah. So, <laughs> so my character lives in a very high socioeconomic echelon. And they don't like that. They don't yeah. like it when they see us in high economic echelons. So it's very, and because of the art world, yeah. I know it. The most diverse part of New York City is the Upper East Side. Why? It's got all the museums. You have the Asia Society. You go and see a Picasso and a Miro. Like it's it, it, at the Met, you have Velasquez and Goy. Like the, that's the mo and the and the patrons. You hear mm -hmm. the languages that's spoken on the Upper East Side. A lot of Spanish. They don't like it when we exist in a high socioeconomic place. And they they really push against that. So I I, I try and put us there to be like. The richest man in the world is Carlos Slim, who's a Mexican. Suck on that. You know, <laughs> that's something that they do understand yeah. in a very capitalist society, right? Money talks. <coughs> so that, that's something that I, I, I don't think that sometimes you're not going to have the money to do something. It's like the Yankees. If the rule was the biggest payroll wins every World Series, the Yankees would win every single one. But they don't win every World Series. Right. It's a double-edged sword. It's a catch-22. It's both sides of it. But I also agree that there's a way to work through the system and, and show that you're financially viable. Do you know what makes more money in Miami theatrically? Spanish language plays. Mm -hmm. I have yet, in three years that I've been back, I've yet to go to a Spanish language play that has been sold out. Yeah. American crazy. theaters wish yeah. Yeah. they had the yeah. audience <coughs> that the Cuban theaters have here. They wish, and they don't have yeah. that income. Yeah. But they don't acknowledge us. The American theater community here, like if we didn't exist, and I work in the American theater community. I, I'm, I happen to work with Miami New Drama, that's my home, and they're awesome because they do bilingual stuff. They're Miami Beach. But th it's like we didn't exist. And you're like, we make more money than you. Miami, Michelle Hauser is the first one that says it. He subsidizes his English language season with his Spanish season. Wow. So that does count for a lot. Yeah. That does count for a um, lot. One thing that I, because you, you, your statement about how, how you met him and all of that, triggered on me something about what is better, talent hmm. or representation? Oh, my first question was, is it good? <laughs> and, then I and, asked, is he and, Hispanic? <laughs> <laughs> because that's one thing that I, it, it's always kind of like, when we, I go to this kind of conference, it's, it's like conferences or talks, or, uh, it's always like representation, 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 mm -hmm. but it's not just about that. If I, ha I hold auditions, I see like hundreds of people every single year, and I'm like, if the best, best ones happen to be two white males and one African-American person that is, it's like I would cast whoever is the best because they are the best. But think because about art. why they're the best. 
Well, and like, the what what measure are you using yeah, for best? Right. The well, places yeah. the training. And you know what the most in, but, but, important thing for an artist to do is to do their work. And when mm -hmm. an entire community, like black people or Hispanic people, are constantly told you can only do one at a time, then you are not allowed to be no, the no, best. No, but, you know, I, the, point, the point that, where I'm, where, that I'm trying to make is, we've been doing uh, mix castings. Like our company has been around for 40 years, 42 Which now. One? Fantasy Theater Factory. Uh, we've been doing theater for 42 years. We've been doing mixed cast forever. Mm -hmm. Because we can do it because we do theater for young audiences. So those labels of race don't matter. And we go to Wachula, we go to the center of Florida because we're a touring theater company. And when people see there, it's like, ooh, you had, you had a black Cinderella? Yes, she was the best. Oh, you have The meritocracy is interesting though because the industry pretends to work as a meritocracy and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is, as Latinos, you don't want to adopt that false model. You, you want it to be a true meritocracy. But I, then there's I, this I other would. institutional thing. I mean, I do believe the talent should have been out all the time, even though it rarely does. Because if it did, Britney Spears would never have been a thing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but, no, I'm just kidding, not Britney. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? But, I but, but, but there is institution, there, there is opportunity, there is when people get a chance to work and when they don't get a chance to work. I think blind color casting is brilliant. In my play, they wanted to do blind color casting, but I was talking about a very white auction house. And I said, listen, I'm all for blind color casting, but if the head, my boss is a woman of color at the moment of crisis, she's gonna be expected to help me, which takes away from the emotional art. And I said, besides, Michelle, the minute we leave Miami, there's already four black people in this play because there's four Cubans in it. It's like, oh, that's right, <laughs> you know? So it's interesting because it's, it's how do you maneuver, how do you, you have to compromise all those yeah. spaces and maneuver all those pieces. You next to this gentleman here, you had something to say and I wanted to. Yeah, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> I just think it's lost. No, but, bring it know, up, bring it um, up. I don't know, I think like, I kind of want to ask a general question because it seems like a lot of the conversation is about like, okay, so, um, our representation as Latinx artists is inherently political, and the more we are represented, that in itself is political. Mm -hmm. And um, also that it's human, because being to be human is to be political. Yeah, but I guess like, a, and like, a, like Ramel kind of brought up that kind of like tweaked me a little bit is like, I feel like sometimes what we're talking about is seeking a bigger piece of the pie, mm -hmm. when the pie is already kind of predicated on a lot of systemic oppression that's like just historical, it's a reality, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is like, is this conversation about politics exclusively about how we represent ourselves, how we get that bigger piece of the pie, or is there an additional extension of political work that we're talking about as artists other than just getting ourselves in there? Like, I think that's my question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if I may answer it quickly, yeah. I see it as, I see, I, in, in my perspective from the way that I see it, I see it as both. Yeah. The more the more visible that we are, the more we reach that household in Alabama that's never seen a Latino, mm -hmm. because <laughs> we created that space in the industry, the more that might change a perspective or change a heart. But without theater that serves the community, then what are we doing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I, for me, just so that you know, I saw it as both things. Yeah. If it got in one way, well, I think forgive we've just been me. Talking a lot about, about industry. So let's let's industry. move a little bit into what you're talking about then, community, and how do we expand these spaces in our community? Right, I'll kick it to Rose because she's kind of Rose, next. please. So um, I was just uh, kind of thinking of one one of the big things I learned from the LDC and one of the images that we used from the very beginning was approaching um, approaching things from a standpoint of wealth as opposed to why don't I get any, or we don't have enough, or we're fighting for the crumbs, we're fighting for the piece. Right. Approaching it from, we have the feast, we're making the table, we have a lot of comida on it. Mm -hmm. So approaching that we have a lot of things to offer. Right. And then you get yourself a little bit out of the mindset of victimhood. Why don't I have you know, lights, yeah. why don't yeah. I have costumes, why do I have to keep borrowing things? So that's one thing. Hold on, there's something else I wrote down. Oh, and then about, um, representation, um, I think it's a many-pronged approach. So it's infiltration. Yeah, you wanna be oh, in. Oh, I love that word. <laughs> yeah, infiltration, you wanna be in these big regional theaters, but you also wanna you know, not forget about your, your community, and you 
there are some stories that may appeal to some theaters and some audiences and some you may, however you choose to say it, white, whiten it up or uncuban it or, you know, Peruvian mix it for certain audiences and then for somewhere else you do it in a different language. So I think it's attacking it from many sides. And just to finish kind of uh, the idea, so it's not one or the other. Um, and you can have your play at the rep in Seattle and you can still take that same play or scenes of it and go to the different local shelters and do it in English and Spanish and yeah. that's what our theater company does. So you can have it both, so you can have a bunch of stuff. Hopefully Let one would subsidize the other. And, and usually it's the other way there. around. Usually it's the shelter because that you apply for these grants mm -hmm. that is gonna help you get your, you know, your three weekends that you know, at the rep that cost so much money. Right. La last thought, the thickening of the story, it's a term I got, um, so my, my, my passion is narrative medicine, which I'm, I've been doing these workshops at Columbia University. There's a, a field of bringing together medicine and storytelling, and storytelling is an act of healing. So just wanna reflect that I heard that come up. And one of, um, one of the points made by Dr. Rita Sharon, who founded this program along with a, um, the head of the film um, department at NYU. So that's how, how it comes together. Film, MD, they create this program. Uh, she was talking about the thickening of the story and how we ourselves, um, we have to learn to thicken our stories. Sometimes, you know, kind of like a paper doll. Yeah. You know, it's kind of flat, yeah, yeah. maybe a little thicker, but you know, and, and as we fold in different, you know, three-dimensional stories, we're making our story thicker. Yeah. And that applies to medicine too, and patients and patient stories. But um, yeah, so I just, you know, these kinds of circles I think <coughs> helps us thicken our stories. So, so there wouldn't be any, you know, antagonism between represent, I want the best, or I want to give opportunity. It's, it, it is coming it from it, many it's angles. It's a weed, it, it works together. I totally know what you're saying. But I, that, that thickening of the story is something that from the beginning of my career was very attractive to me as well. Because when I was doing these little monologues and these 10 minute things, sometimes I would marry the stories of two monologues into one character. And then it would deepen the, you know, because we live thick lives. We do. Unless we're dumb as a doornail, then we're just happy and everything's fine. <laughs> but we live thick lives. We live vertically, right? I go to Publix and they don't have the right chocolate chip cookie and I'm like, God damn it. And I came all the way here, and I really wanted a soft one, and then we have our ones today. And it's Shakespearean, right? Nothing <laughs> stupid. But what I'm really reacting to is that I just watched MSNBC for two hours, and I'm furious. And it's my inability to do anything that, you know, so, but we live thick lives, and how do we find these intersections as opposed to separating them? And I think guilt the companies, too. Guilt the hell out of the people who make money off Pharma. of us. We have, we have 10 minutes, or maybe some of the- Oh yeah, the please. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Beautiful red shawl. Oh, thanks. Um, so thank you for this conversation. I really appreciate everybody's questions and thoughts. It's really inspiring. Um, I want to respond, I think, I'm going to respond a lot, but I want to, I think the latest one had to do with the question of what this, there's a way in which I also share the, the, the feeling that there's a conflation of um, not only region in which we represent, in which we do our work, but also media. So we're talking about film, we're talking about television, we're talking about theater, we're talking about audience. Um, and for me, ultimately, I think what's distilled for me is the question of intentionality. Yes. In other words, there are different ways I'm going to approach my work depending on what's my medium, right. what's my region, what's my given, given that all of that may be underneath the giant hegemonic presence of a, of a culture that seeks to erase my stories, erase the story of my friends and my family, um, and, and undermine its thickness and flatten it. Right. Right, and so my task ultimately always has been about Thickening. I've never used that term before, but it's, it's so great. appropriate. I'm stealing it, Rosa. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. because ultimately, what we're battling against is ignorance. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Is a is a is a is a vision of who Latinos or Hispanics are right. that has been created for us, and so representation to me is is the act of or or decolonizing, whatever, is the act of owning our own narrative and telling our mm -hmm. stories in whatever way we want to. So 
So ultimately, I go back to the question of intentionality, how? And then I will know, and what, and where. And once I have those things figured out, th then I go into the work. And, and whether it's with only people who share that particular story or a broader group that includes allies who can feel it and understand and also share an outrage um, in, the, in the generation of this, or, or, or also share a desire to show my audience their beauty, um, then, um, then I know what I'm dealing with. And, and all of those have different, that's why we have an all, all and answer here, but I think I, I wanna just advocate for the intention, which is to be political. Yeah. I think that's beautiful, and I think that's what's universal, right? Because I have much more to learn from a Mexicano, from a Chicano, from a Puerto Rican, from a Dominican, from a Colombian, from a Brazilian, by acknowledging that we're different than we're the same. But the intention is the one thing that crosses any cultural um, experience, right? It's, that intention, it's gotta be everything. Because that, that's how you shoot out of the gate. And sometimes I think because of the multimedia, because media is the one that shaped the way that we see each other, yeah. right? So because of the multimedia, and because of the media that's out there, we have these ideas about one another that are ridiculous and that are wrong and that keep getting perpetuated. And I think if we focus more on intention as opposed to identity, we might find we're able to blast through a couple more walls and take a little bit more agency than they're willing to give us. Because nobody's gonna give you agency. Nobody's gonna give you the power. That doesn't exist. You and, take and briefly, it. And, sorry, and, and, and understand that our intention, that that, that that blasting through walls has in itself its own power. And that we are inherently, if we, if we identify, because there's plenty of Latinx artists out there who don't necessarily identify as like, my work is going to be Latinx. I'm just doing my work. Right. right? And that's great and wonderful because they are, nevertheless going to be seen as whether they want to or whether not. Whether they want to or not, yeah. and they're doing their work boldly. Mm -hmm. That thing that you said earlier, oh for the day, and I tweeted this, oh for the day <laughs> that we can that, that we can just do dull work. Right. <laughs> and I mean I never want to do dull work. No, of course. Yes. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean absolutely. I know I know what you meant by that. And so that and so that the, the freedom to do that, right? Um, but but the understanding that at this point, at this time, particularly whether we want to, like, you know, whether we want to or not, you know, uh, uh, we are represented. And so acknowledging that is the first, is the first step toward intentionality. Very we can important. own it or not own it, but yeah. it's gonna be owned for us. Absolutely, absolutely. And this sort of goes back to your point, I think, about the political thing, and I, I would ask us to, as us here in the group, but also in our community, you know, broadly speaking, are we looking critically internally at um, anti-blackness in our own community, yes. homophobia mm -hmm. in our own community, yes. mm -hmm. right? Misogyny in our community. Like, are we showing up for trans lives? It, you know, think 100%. in our communities. Are we talking? Are we trying to sort of pick apart our internalized racism and how race has been constructed in Latin America that that is outside of sort of the dominant white you know right. gaze here? Right. Are we having those conversations in our theater companies? Yes. Are we reifying how we see indigenous? bodies on stage, do we have indigenous bodies on, you know, so can we, can we take yes, a we pause do. from outside mm -hmm. of Absolutely. the American, the, and then, and do that hard work here, and that hard work is not only on our stages, but like at our dinner table with our grandparents, which right. can be the hardest work, and so I think sometimes we get so, and I'm uh, guilty of this too, concerned with how we're being represented outside, but then, but are we then replicating those models? Because we inherit, yeah. we inherit all of those systems, right? So Absolutely. I think for and me, the political is, yeah. it has mm -hmm. to be rooted there, right? But I'll even push back a little bit. Not only do we inherit some of those systems, we created oh, some yes. of those systems. Yeah. So we're, that, that's when I say that we have to take accountability for ourselves. Yeah. Nobody really <laughs> likes a saint, <laughs> right? You're like, oh, there's the saint. But I don't want to sit next to a saint at a party, right? So if we take responsibility for our own actions, for our own racism, for our own classism, for our own misogyny, our stories are gonna be even more powerful. And they're gonna land even more so with people that are not us. I learned the most growing up from Jews, blacks, and the Cubans I would hear on the radio. Now I'm a Cuban kid from Miami. I grew up in Jewish neighborhoods. I didn't have Cuban friends other than family until I came back to do my solo play, Rum and Coke, but if I could learn from them, they could learn from me. And the, when was I learning? In a time of Richard Pryor, 
you know, and, 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 and Lenny Bruce, and like these people that are, uh, Woody Allen, if you hear the way Woody Allen talks about his own community, I know he's not a good example, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just saying culturally, I'm just saying we have to hold ourselves accountable. Bad example, but you guys know what I mean, right? We have to hold ourselves accountable because if not, we're just victims, and then they can separate us. They can keep us like, oh, look at what we did to them. We gotta hold ourselves accountable for our own racism because it's ugly, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, and we perpetuate it, we're the ones doing blackface. Yes. yes. We're the ones right. doing blackface. Yes, 100%. Disgusting. So that's like, th and then that, it, it all goes, you know, it's all full circle. So basically, we're all political beings, I would say. The, uh, the last thing I want to say, because I'm sure we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> you really should have never put a Cuban <laughs> moderating this. I'm like, lesson learned. Wrap it up. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I would highly encourage you all to exchange information. If you live in different cities, good. Become friends on Facebook. The person sitting next to you is gonna be your biggest advocate. Even if you don't necessarily connect with their art form, how can you help them make their art form happen? What skill set can you offer somebody else? Abundance. We are nothing if not extreme, right? We have lots of everything. And the more we give, the more power we have with each other, with ourselves, with our stories. Be abundant, be abundant with each other and help each other every chance you get. Think of somebody right now that you can reach out to when you go back home or something, or back to your city or back home here, a theater company, an actor, a something, that you can say, hey, if you wanna work on a project, let me know. Even if it's gonna take your time and whatever, if you need me to read a script, I'm happy to do it. If you want to do a reading in my living room, I'm happy to offer my living room. We are only as good as those we support. Mm. And we have so much brilliant work in our community to get out there. So just like focus on each other, help each other out, support each other, and just love, just really lean into the abundance, just eat it up. Because it's all there and it's right for us to really tear it apart. <laughs> I think that's it. Oh. <laughs>